posted. So good morning, everybody. My name is Martin Peters. I'm the uh, director of the partnership on university plagiarism prevention. So welcome to everybody. And this morning, we're very, very happy to have um, one of our um, colleagues that is one of our co-researchers in the PUP, uh, Dr. Salim Khazi, who we will be presenting. He's from Kanakale. I'm, I'm never sure I can pronounce this properly. Kanakale Ozekiv Mart University. How's that, Salim? So, so? Yeah, better, better, Martin, good try. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. So he is from Turkey and he's also uh, the founder and director of the Kong Center for Academic Integrity. He's board member of NI, which is the European Network for Academic Integrity. He is extremely active in every project that he works with and we're extremely fortunate that he's part of our team. And so he's going to present tomorrow, this morning on the anonymous multimediated writing model in preventing plagiarism. So give a warm welcome to Salim Razi. And um, Salim, you have approximately 57 minutes if you want to leave a little bit of time at the end uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, please make sure if you have questions, you can put them as we go in the discussion. If not, um, you can keep them till the end for Salim. Alors Salim, I'm leaving you the floor. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the lovely introduction and uh, the invitation as well uh, for this webinar. Bonjour, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to see you all here. Plagiarism experts uh, all over the world. Uh, and I am so happy uh, today to talk about the anonymous multimediated writing model uh, that I developed uh, with the hope of preventing uh, plagiarism. And uh, indeed, uh, in this presentation, I would like to share my experiences uh, as a writing teacher at the university. So uh, there are lessons, uh, there are some important lessons uh, that I got uh, from my students, learned by, uh, from my students. And uh, I'd like to share these experiences, inform you about these lessons. Uh, through the model that I developed today. Uh, please just give me a second. I'll share my screen for the presentation. I hope you are able to see the presentation. Is this fine, Martin? Okay. So uh, what are we supposed to be doing today? First of all, uh, in order to make it sure that uh, we are talking about the same thing when it comes to plagiarism, uh, I'd like to share my definite, uh, my uh, favorite definition of plagiarism from uh, Teddy Fishman with you so that we understand that uh, we agree on what plagiarism is. And then uh, I'd like to call your attention to the risk of plagiarism, especially when it comes to academic writing and especially uh, when it comes to writing in a foreign language or writing uh, in a language uh, other than uh, native language. And then uh, I'm going to uh, show some cases, some plagiarism cases uh, from my courses, uh, which helped me to develop uh, the model. Uh, with the help of uh, these cases, uh, I will uh, provide some theoretical background for the anonymous multimedia writing model, uh, and then uh, we will see uh, how it how it goes with the model. First of all, uh, when we ask the question, what plagiarism is? Uh, indeed, I'd like to make a reference to uh, Teddy here. Uh, Teddy provides uh, some basic components uh, of what plagiarism is and when plagiarism occurs. Here, for example, first of all, plagiarism occurs when someone uses words, ideas, or work products. Uh, especially uh, in academic writing, of course, uh, we are focusing on, uh, when, when we uh, refer to plagiarism, we are focusing mainly on words. However, uh, we, should, we should be very careful here uh, relating to especially idea plagiarism. Uh, specifically, uh, when we make references to text 
publishing software. Uh, sometimes idea plagiarism uh, may not be taken into consideration because of the flawbacks of uh, text matching software. However, it is, it is quite important for us that uh, plagiarism uh, does not only occur with reference to words. Uh, it includes ideas or any other work products. And secondly, here in this definition, we see that attributable to another identifiable person. Okay, uh, there is a definition of plagiarism by Teddy Fishman. Okay, it is attributable to her. Uh, so if I borrow any expression here, if I borrow any ideas without attributing it, then it means that uh, I will be accused of plagiarism here in this case, for example. And also uh, in, the, in the next part of this definition, we see that without attributing the work to the source from which it was obtained. Okay, now what do I need to do here? For example, in this presentation, I am making uh, an in-text citation to Fishman and then in my reference list, uh, I am providing more detailed information so that uh, it, it becomes traceable by the other uh, people. And here uh, as audience, you are attending an academic session. so. Uh, indeed, uh, you have an expectation from me to, to sound academic here. So it means that I need to support my claims here with reference to the other sources. And more importantly here, uh, towards the end of uh, the definition, uh, we see that uh, in order to obtain some benefit, credit or gain. So what is the benefit from the student's perspective? For example, uh, they pass their classes suppose they pass the class without any effort, for example, then uh, it, it becomes an academic uh, misconduct here. And uh, the important part here is which need not be monetary. However, uh, when we, we make reference to contract cheating, for example, we can see that uh, financial issues may also uh, uh, be, be important for us. However, uh, there is no requirement for this. Okay, then considering this, definition in our mind, let's move to uh, academic writing, characteristics of academic writing and uh, risks of uh, plagiarism in academic writing here. Uh, we should have a consensus uh, here uh, with all uh, participants that academic writing is complicated. It is, it is complicated even for us as uh, senior academics, senior researchers. And especially when it comes to students uh, considering uh, the pop project, for example, we are giving our full attention to undergraduate students. So in their case, then uh, it becomes more complicated for them. The, the tasks, academic writing tasks uh, uh, become uh, more challenging for them. This increase the risk of plagiarism. In it now, I'd like to make a reference to uh, expanding circle here. However, uh, some of you may not be familiar with this terminology. So uh, I'd like to make reference to Kachru here. Uh, Kachru identified three circles uh, relating to uh, teaching English as a foreign language. In the first circle, this is called as inner circle. Uh, there are countries such as UK, uh, US and Canada, for example, where uh, English is spoken uh, as, uh, as uh, L1. And then uh, in the second circle, uh, then we move to the other countries where English is spoken as L2. These are the countries such as, for example, uh, African countries. In addition to their native tongues, these people are using English, for example, uh, for official purposes. And then uh, in the third circle, circle, now we have the other people, the other countries where English is not spoken either as L1 or L2, but spoken as a foreign language or as an additional language uh, with reference to a uh, more recent uh, terminology. The issue becomes uh, more complicated, right? uh, writing in English becomes more or complicated, especially for students uh, who are expected to write in English, submit an assignment in English, which is not their native language. And here we need to uh, we need to uh, take cross-cultural differences into consideration. I mean, for example, in some societies, uh, uh, making reference to the other sources or uh, supporting the claims uh, might be different from the other societies, especially 
in uh, Far Eastern countries, for example, we can, uh, we can see uh, some striking uh, differences here. So when we talk about academic writing, we need to take all these uh, issues into consideration. And of course, uh, here, uh, more importantly, we also need to take policies, academic integrity policies, if they are available, of course, nationwide policies or institutional policies uh, or sometimes micro policies by the lecturers, uh, they should all be taken into consideration. And uh, th these undergraduate students, they are inexperienced, inexperienced in academic writing. And uh, I revealed that uh, in my research, uh, they are even inexperienced in writing their L1. So uh, even writing informal papers. So this becomes an issue when we ask them uh, to write academic papers. Now I'd like to move to, uh, my academic writing skills course. Uh, uh, by the way, I'd like to inform you that uh, I am working as an associate professor at English language teaching department of uh, faculty of education at my institution. Uh, at the department, we are training uh, this English language teaching department. It means that we are training uh, English as a foreign language teachers. And uh, we have academic writing skills course uh, for the first year students. This is a two semester course. And uh, in this session, uh, I'm going to make reference to academic writing skills course, which is, uh, which is for two semesters. Now I'll make a specific reference to uh, 2010. I obtained my PhD in 2010. And after obtaining my PhD, uh, I had more time uh, and more energy uh, to devote uh, to my students. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I felt more confident uh, because, of, uh, because of completing uh, my PhD. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just after obtaining my PhD, I, I, I had some suspicions uh, about plagiarism uh, cases in my academic writing course. So uh, what did I do? Uh, at that time, uh, I was asking my students to submit their assignments via email. So uh, I was collecting the assignments via email and then uh, I was uh, evaluating and then scoring their assignments uh, by, uh, by, checking, uh, by checking the attachments from the emails. Uh, at that time, I had 172 students enrolled in my academic writing skills course. And at the end of the semester, I revealed that exactly 100 of them plagiarized. It doesn't, uh, uh, 100 uh, does not make a direct reference to major plagiarism here. So, some, some of the students, for example, uh, they borrowed uh, uh, some sentences without making proper references. So uh, I don't, I don't uh, claim that all these 100 students uh, had intentional plagiarism. Some of them uh, could be regarded as accidental plagiarism. However, uh, as a result, 100 of them plagiarized. So I was shocked because uh, until that time, I thought that I was doing my job properly and I was teaching academic writing properly. So uh, I, was, I was really shocked. Uh, the first thing that I uh, did at that time, uh, I, I remember, I immediately uh, informed my dean about this case. And I told him, okay, uh, we need an immediate reaction here uh, because uh, I, I revealed this. And if we do nothing, it means that it will, uh, it will become an habit for our, our students. So uh, considering the principles of behaviorism here, we need to understand stimulus response relationship. Uh, so uh, it can easily be turned into habit and then uh, further generations uh, may have an intention of doing something similar uh, in the next year. I told him uh, they will all fail. All these 100 students will fail. Uh, they won't have any chances uh, to resubmit their assignment this semester. 
so they will repeat. And he said, okay, uh, I support you. I support any decision that you take here uh, because I trust you. And I did this. Of course, uh, af after uh, seeing that 100 students failed from this course uh, because of plagiarism, indeed, it called the attention of all the other students. So indeed, uh, as, as an initial reaction, it was, it was successful. In this case, of course, uh, maybe uh, this may become a question uh, for the participants. Uh, if they would like to have an immediate reaction, immediate response now, uh, I am more than happy to listen to them. Otherwise, uh, we, can, uh, we can leave time uh, for their responses at the end of the session today. What would you do in this case, for example, if, you're, if you were the, the teacher there, and if you revealed that almost uh, two thirds of your students are plagiarizing, what would you do? Uh, this, this is the question uh, to you. Indeed, when I attended uh, a conference in uh, 2016, Irene Glendening, uh, she is also uh, uh, one, of, one of the contributors of uh, the POP project. Uh, Irene Glendening provided uh, a list, a possible list of sanctions for the plagiarizers, such as, for example, no action. Okay, they are plagiarizing. Okay, it's it's not my responsibility. No action. Verbal warning, formal written warning, remedial education, reduced mark, even it goes to financial penalty or expulsion uh, or record uh, on students' files. So as you see, indeed, uh, we have a list of very uh, extensive list of sanctions here. Now, the important thing, what shall we do? Considering my institution, unfortunately, at that time, the procedures for the plagiarizers, it was not very clear. Uh, however, uh, I got the support from the dean. However, as you can understand, uh, this is a mutual relationship. I mean, I visited the dean, explained the situation, and he supported. Suppose, for example, I might have received some other reaction from, from the dean, for example. So uh, here, indeed, uh, academic misconduct cases and clear policies, transparent and consistent policies, these are, these are important here. Uh, and I'd like to make reference to policies, maybe policy, uh, academic integrity policies, institutional policies, uh, later, uh, later uh, in this presentation. Okay, this was this was the first thing that I did. They failed, but what about for the next year? I'll be teaching the same course for the next year. If I do uh, the same thing uh, for the next year, it means that I'll be getting the same results. So I need to I need to improve uh, my teaching methodology. It was my luck that. Then uh, at that time uh, on our uh, university library webpage, I saw uh, I saw that uh, our university uh, was promoting Turnitin. Uh, we had institutional a new institutional uh, membership to Turnitin, so license to Turnitin to use it uh, for our courses. Uh, and I I saw that oh this may help. So for the following years, I put a notice in my syllabus, okay. No email submissions will be taken into consideration. All student submissions will be uh, via Turnitin. Okay, then I was, I was expecting that, okay. I am using, at that time, we called it as plagiarism detector, not, uh, not text matching software. Okay, this is a plagiarism detector, so I, will detect plagiarism, and if I am able to detect plagiarism, no student will be able to dare submitting a plagiarized assignment. What happens next? Okay, you see, you see the results uh, from, uh, from, from the forthcoming year, and uh, we can compare what happens here. Uh, considering that I have 100 additional students from the previous year uh, in uh, in the next year, I had 272 students. So uh, students failed, 
it was something bad for the student, but it was worse for me as a teacher because I, I had to deal with 272 students. In the previous year, 100 of uh, 172 students plagiarized. The numbers decreased to 31 out of 272. So we can, we can say that there is a different impact of text matching software here in terms of reducing the number of plagiarized assignments. However, if you can see uh, no submission figure here and compare, compare the numbers, in the previous year, only 33 of 172 students did not submit their assignment. However, when it comes to next year, this increased to 72. What does it mean? It means that students uh, who felt that, uh, okay, we will be submitting via Turnitin, what happens if something goes wrong? So potential plagiarizers or maybe over anxious students, they decided not to submit an assignment. As you see, uh, it almost tripled the number of uh, no submissions, almost tripled here. I'm a teacher and uh, this, is, this is the last thing that I, that I desire here because I am trying to encourage my students to write their own papers and then uh, to, to learn to practice uh, academic writing skills. So I thought that, okay, uh, I, I'll be using Turnitin, but I need to do something else. Uh, so uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, understand uh, the real problem, uh, I conducted some other studies. Here, for example, uh, you see reports from one of my studies uh, here. I reported the difficulties uh, that my students are experiencing when they are writing uh, their papers. However, be careful, uh, these are self-reported difficulties. I mean, what students believe uh, they experience uh, as, a, as a challenging aspect of academic writing. And then, considering their assignments, I cross-checked their perception, perceived difficulties with my own observation from their, uh, from their papers. I compared them to each other and revealed them, revealed that indeed their, uh, their problems, perceived problems, do not match with their actual problems. So indeed, I understood that, okay, uh, some of my students are not aware of their real problems. So we need to, we need to do something here. I mean, especially at that time, I thought that uh, I, need to, I need to provide uh, more feedback to my students. I need to increase feedback opportunities to my students so that uh, they can become uh, aware of uh, their, uh, their real problems uh, in academic writing. Indeed, uh, I conducted several other studies, uh, for example, investigating uh, and inviting plagiarizing students, for example, some interview sessions to understand why they are plagiarizing and then analyzing uh, the characteristics of uh, their written assignments and then comparing different types of feedback. And uh, all uh, these different uh, research studies helped me uh, to develop my own uh, academic writing model. This is uh, what I call as anonymous multimediated uh, writing model. Indeed, uh, I, I was able to uh, finalize the model in uh, 2015 and in 2015 uh, I got Turnitin Global Innovation Award uh, for the model uh, that I developed and then later uh, I published uh, several papers uh, relating to this model. What happens in this model? Uh, indeed, uh, the ideas are quite simple here. Uh, in this model, I'm benefiting from process approach. And I'm asking my students uh, to submit assignments in, in, in uh, several steps, such as, for example, uh, they uh, submit their topic first, and then narrow down their topic, brainstorm, and then 
prepare an outline. Uh, they blend sources, references in their outline and submit an new version and then write their first draft, second draft, and then revise for mechanical mistakes, proofread, and then submit the final version, which is, uh, we are already familiar in uh, process approach. And here, uh, uh, the important aspect uh, is, we need to provide feedback to the students so that they will be able to understand uh, concepts that are working uh, good in their papers and uh, uh, the issues that need uh, that they need to develop in their papers. For this purpose, uh, I checked the relevant literature and uh, tried to understand the theories uh, behind exchanging peer feedback. And I revealed uh, several theories here, as you see, as you see from the relevant literature. And more importantly. Uh, in addition to process approach. More importantly, I found out uh, two important theories. One, zone of proximal development from Vygotsky, and the other one, scaffolding. Okay, we need to scaffold students. How, how I can scaffold students? I try to uh, combine uh, these re re uh, relevant theories with each other uh, by the help of my model. Okay, feedback is important. Remember, I had 272 students uh, in the next year who, are who were enrolled in my class, 272 students. And if as a teacher, I try to provide feedback at every step of this process writing, it means that I can do nothing else, only teach this course. However, this is not the case. Uh, and I have several other uh, responsibilities. So I need to make it doable. In this case, uh, I thought that I should benefit from peer feedback. Okay, I'm going to ask my students to exchange peer feedback with each other. However, when I checked the relevant literature, I revealed that uh, peer feedback does not work properly in some cases, especially uh, I identified two problems here. The first problem, there will be students who will be misleading each other. Suppose, for example, there is a good student in academic writing and there is a poor student compared to the other one in academic writing. We match them with each other and ask them to exchange peer feedback. Okay, poor student will be getting uh, good feedback, high quality feedback from the good student. However, it is not the case for the good student because the good, the good student will be receiving low quality feedback uh, from uh, from this uh, the other weak student. This was an issue. And the second one, students uh, were reluctant to criticize their friends because uh, it, it might have an impact on their social relationship with their friends. So what did I do? Uh, first of all, I decided to run peer feedback procedures in an anonymous way which is quite similar to what happens when we submit a manuscript to a journal. Okay, the editor assigns reviewers and we don't know about the identity of the reviewers. Uh, uh, and it is, it is the case for the reviewers, they don't know about our identity. So I did the same thing, run uh, the uh, process anonymously. And instead of matching individual students with each other, I matched every student paper with three other students. However, uh, these three other students are not randomly assigned. I subcategorized my students into three categories depending on their uh, academic writing skills. Good students, moderate students, and poor students. So when I match a paper, I match it with one good, one moderate, one poor peer. It means that every student will be receiving uh, a different quality level feedback. Now, when they receive the feedback, what do they need to do? First of all, they need to check the accuracy of the feedback, credibility of the feedback. Indeed, uh, as 
authors, we are doing something similar. When we submit the manuscript and when we receive the reviewer report, we do not automatically correct uh, and accept uh, rev reviewer suggestions. Uh, we, we check whether uh, the reviewer is uh, asking uh, some, something reasonable or not. So uh, I, I try to uh, I try to instruct the same concept to my students here. Critically evaluate the quality of the feedback and then act accordingly. This is important. And when we check it from, from the literature, we see that asymmetrical and symmetrical feedback. Uh, symmetrical feedback comes from uh, people who are at the same level. Asymmetrical feedback comes from people at different levels. So here uh, I am distributing asymmetrical feedback from, from peers. And more importantly, uh, when my students uh, are exchanging feedback, they do this by using the rubric that I developed. Indeed, this is the rubric uh, that I developed, uh, this transparent academic writing rubric that I call, and I use this rubric uh, to, uh, to assign scores to my students at the end of the semester. However, in my courses, I, uh, I have instructions uh, on this rubric. I make my uh, students familiar with this rubric, with every element in the rubric, and then I, can, uh, I show them uh, what criteria they need to take into consideration in their paper, uh, matching every 15 elements, uh, 15 criteria uh, in my rubric there. Then they use the rubric and by considering the 50 items, they provide feedback to the peers. So I'm using the assessment tool as a learning tool throughout the semester. This, uh, this is something, uh, making uh, exchanging feedback easy and making it in a standardized uh, way uh, in a manner. Maybe you are worried, okay, uh, what happens, Salim, after uh, you start developing your model? Uh, were you able to observe any changes, especially relating to plagiarism uh, incidents in your, in your classes? Uh, you know, you already know the story for the first year from 100 to 31, and then uh, what happens to 20, 28, 14, 5, and 4. As you see, the number of plagiarizing students uh, decrease. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that we we never see zero plagiarism here. So, whatever you do. Uh, this is uh, this is my lesson that I learned. Whatever you do, there will be students who have an intention of plagiarizing. They might be doing this accidentally or uh, sometimes with intentions. However, uh, I guarantee that there will be students who have an intention of plagiarizing. However, the good thing here uh, is that uh, there are very few students uh, who who plagiarize, and uh, this this becomes a, a standard for my courses. Every every semester, uh, I can detect four or five plagiarizing students, which which is acceptable because uh, I can I can work this uh, with these four and five students, and then uh, try to explain uh, the problems in their uh, papers. However. Uh, the other the other papers uh, seem to be uh, fine. Then, uh, with reference to COVID situation, we move to emergency remote teaching, and uh, after we move to remote uh, emergency remote teaching, uh, I was worried about uh, how my model would work. Indeed, since I was collecting all assignments on a digital platform by using Turnitin, uh, it was at first it seemed uh, doable even in emergency remote teaching. However, 
uh, I wanted to double check it with a with a research study, and I I revised my model by adding some additional components. Uh, here I'd like to uh, clarify uh, more information about my syllabus and the topics and the assignments that uh, I am giving in my classes. As I uh, told you previously, this is a two semester course and this is the first semester. I call this uh, as controlled writing practices in the first semester. I ask my students to submit three assignments during the semester. And each assignment is approximately 700 words. I give the topic, I give the reference sources, three or four sources for each assignment. They just uh, prepare the outline and, and then submit first draft. After they submit their first draft, they receive feedback from their peers. And also they receive feedback from me as their teacher, however, this is not an individual feedback, this is conference feedback. It means that I take their assignments and then I take some excerpts, some important uh, examples from the excerpts uh, and then uh, show them in the uh, classroom. Uh, by using these examples, I make explanations because uh, I experience uh, similar problems in several uh, student assignments because this is, this is a controlled practice. And then uh, I, I encourage them for submitting revision assignments. And then they submit their revised assignments by considering the conference feedback that I provide and also peer feedback that they provide. And uh, after each assignment, they are submitting a reflection paper. I mean, uh, explaining the difficulties and also explaining the uh, development that they observe with reference to academic writing skills. Uh, indeed, uh, in my courses, what do we do? In the first semester, uh, we pay specific attention to in-text citations, how, how they uh, cite the other sources when they are writing papers. So they try to especially uh, practice uh, paraphrasing skills and uh, direct quotations uh, and also uh, synthesizing information coming from uh, several sources. Of course, uh, as, as you see on the right-hand column, uh, we pay attention to uh, other uh, academic integrity issues and also uh, academic writing uh, rules in addition to uh, all these issues. When it comes to the other semester, this time uh, I call this as a free writing practice. This time, uh, they are expected to write a paper, which is approximately 2,000 word length, uh, excluding references. Uh, however, they need to choose the topic themselves, and they need to find uh, uh, the reference sources that they will be using uh, to support their uh, claims themselves. Throughout the semester, of course, uh, I'll be helping them from topic selection to drafting their ideas uh, by the help of the feedback that I am providing. This time, uh, as a teacher, I will be providing more individual feedback because they are working on individual topics according to, according to uh, their expectations. Uh, here, more importantly, uh, I try to teach them uh, about credibility of the sources, uh, some tips about, for example, how they can avoid predatory publishers uh, when they are uh, searching uh, for the relevant literature. Again, uh, they are exchanging, in addition to teacher feedback, they are exchanging uh, peer feedback and also uh, self-feedback and reflection assignments are included here. Uh, basically, I try to I try to uh, categorize three uh, three components here. At the first stage, this is what I call as writing and planning. Uh, they they try to uh, plan their writing. To do this, first of all, I ask them to brainstorm about the topic that they wish to write, and then check the relevant literature, and then prepare their outline. 
After they submit their outline, I provide individual feedback to every student. And then at the next step, I ask them to include references in their outline so that I want to make it sure that for every main idea in their outline, uh, they, have, uh, they have relevant sources to cite it, to support their claims. And then when it comes to writing the paper, uh, they write their first drafts and then again receive teacher feedback. They submit their second draft by taking teacher feedback into consideration. And then uh, I distribute second drafts uh, for peer feedback. And then they receive uh, peer feedback uh, for on their second draft. And then uh, by taking peer feedback into consideration, uh, they, they submit their final assignments. So if you are worried uh, how it worked during emergency remote teaching, I didn't find any significant differences. It means that students' performances were quite similar to face-to-face -to -face teaching. So it, it, worked, uh, it worked almost uh, in the same manner. Uh, they, their, uh, their scores were quite similar and no significant differences were observed and also uh, considering the number of plagiarizing students, uh, there was no increase. So uh, the model worked uh, properly in emergency remote teaching. And uh, a, a few months ago, I was able to uh, publish uh, my, my results uh, in the journal uh, system. Uh, and here I provided a uh, DOI link for your information if you'd like to read more about it. Now I'd like to move to concluding remarks here and uh, so that we can have for about 15 minutes uh, for uh, discussion and uh, to, to respond to your questions. Once again, I'd like to highlight that zero plagiarism is an utopia. Uh, at least in my case, it's an utopia. Uh, I will have plagiarizing students. The only thing I need to do is who is plagiarizing why I need to I need to be careful about it and I need to discriminate uh, accidental plagiarizers from intentional uh, plagiarizers when it comes to uh, my model I believe it helps a lot for the institution of uh, a culture of academic integrity uh, because it's been uh, it's been uh, 13 or 14 years uh, that I devoted my time and energy and uh, we can observe this uh, at least at my department and at the faculty faculty that uh, our students are paying attention uh, to uh, to the promotion of academic integrity and uh, although uh, there are some plagiarizing students, they are quite aware of uh, academic integrity. And uh, I believe that uh, the model maximizes learning because uh, it is uh, providing opportunities to relate assess assessment practices uh, with learning practices, especially by using the rubric as a learning tool. And uh, it provides opportunities for teachers uh, to, uh, to, uh, to encourage their learners to receive feedback from different sources. This is very important, especially for the teachers who are teaching large classes uh, like myself. Otherwise, uh, providing feedback may not be doable for the teachers. And, uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, following the model uh, helps the students to become independent writers because uh, they are practicing both uh, academic writing in a, in a controlled manner by controlled, uh, controlled assignments. And also uh, then uh, to become independent writers, they work on uh, individual topics uh, that, they, that they prefer. Here is the sources that I uh, referred in my presentation, and I'd like to thank you all uh, for being here today, uh, and I'll be happy to 
refer to your questions uh, if you have any. Nobody has any questions, so I might, oh, okay. Emilio, please open your, your mic. There you go, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Salim, thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> um, I have one question with regard to, I was noticing the statistics you posted and your plagiarism cases went down as your instruction progressed. And in your presentation, you clearly took accountability for your instruction, which unfortunately, I don't think a lot of faculty members do they'll deflect the blame and say, well, students need to learn and they'll pass it off. But you, my question is when your numbers went down to five and four, and then you mentioned intentional versus unintentional plagiarism, did those numbers, were those intentional plagiarism attempts or were they unintentional? Because if they're still unintentional, that does contribute to a lack of understanding. And I know that in first year courses, particularly how to write with such high numbers of international students, from my experience, it's impossible for them to learn those skills over the course of one semester. It involves a lot of practice. So that's my question. Did those numbers include intentional or unintentional plagiarism? Uh, thank you, Emilio, for the question. Indeed, uh, it's a mixture. Uh, when I when I check uh, the plagiarizers, I can see that some uh, some of them are doing this uh, on purpose, whereas some others are doing this by mistake. However, when I check uh, the students, especially who do this by mistake, uh, I, I see that these are the students who miss the classes, especially the uh, the students who do not attend the courses and who do not read the instructions uh, clearly because uh, I provide all instructions very clearly to my students from, from the very beginning. Uh, however, uh, these plagiarizing students uh, usually are the ones uh, who do not pay great care uh, to the instructions. Uh, one important aspect here relating to your question, previously I made a reference to academic integrity policies and unfortunately uh, we don't have a proper uh, institutional academic integrity policy. Uh, it's, not, it's not that I am unable to write a policy for my institution. I can, I can easily do this and I can, uh, I can encourage the Senate to accept it. However, I have some worries about it. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, whether it will be applicable by every lecturer. I mean, it's, it, it won't be my policy. I already, as an instructor, I already have my own micro policy. However, when it comes to institutional policy, uh, now we, uh, in, in Turkey, we need to make a reference to meso level policies as well, because uh, we have Council of Higher Education here, and the Council of Higher Education is providing a framework policy, nationwide policy, uh, which should be valid for all universities. So if you are preparing an institutional policy, uh, it should be within the framework provided by uh, Council of Higher Education. Now, uh, I am the coordinator of Facing Academic Integrity Threats Project, which is uh, supported, funded by uh, European Union. And uh, we are in the second year of the project and we are uh, working on exemplary academic integrity policies and we will be providing feedback to policy uh, makers. So indeed, uh, I'm still waiting for the perfect timing uh, to, uh, to suggest an institutional academic integrity policy for my institution uh, with, with reference to the results of the project. Then this will uh, hopefully help especially with reference to intentional plagiarizers. I hope this helps. Salim, you have a question from Christy Kearns, Kearns um, who says, who asks, how do discussions of contract cheating enter into this model? Oh, 
this this is a very difficult question uh, because uh, it is it is more difficult uh, to detect contract cheating. Uh, so far, I have identified very few instances of contract cheating. Uh, however, uh, as, as I said, it is, it is really difficult to detect it. But as a precaution in my model, I try to do my best to prevent my students uh, from contract cheating, being involved in contract cheating. How do I do this? I ask my students to submit drafts. For example, for the pre free practice opportunity, they, they are submitting three draft assignments. And I am providing feedback on their three draft uh, assignment submissions. In addition to providing feedback, I, I also make a determination there. First draft, successful, unsuccessful outline successful unsuccessful if the student receives two unsuccessful within within three out of three it means that the student is not eligible to submit the final version at the end of the semester so there is an encouragement and requirement for the student to study throughout the semester and uh, contract cheating providers they do not provide such services they are providing uh, complete assignments. So I am inviting my students uh, to attend individual sessions. So when I uh, when I provide uh, peer feedback, for example, uh, I'd like to meet my students individually. I ask questions, especially to reveal any anything uh, suspicious, for example, to to make it sure that they wrote it. And also another uh, precaution was I'm asking my students to submit all reference sources, put them in a Google Drive and share the link with me. So uh, I try to make it sure that they find reliable sources, read them, and then write their papers. Contract, contract cheating companies, uh, to my knowledge, they don't provide uh, such, uh, such services to their users. Thank you, Joseph, you have a question. Um, yes, Salim, thank you very much for that presentation. It's awesome. Um, did I hear you say at any time during your presentation that it's a two semester course? Yes, two semester course. Okay, because my curiosity is um, how are you able to initially um, determine between which students are considered um, good enough um, and those that are weak, and then how you're able to do the matching. What did you use to determine that? Um, to know this student is good, this student is not, uh, this student is weak, because the proper writing, the main writing itself comes up in the second term, uh, second semester, not in the first semester. Um, can you just please clarify the steps you take to make that determination? Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you for the question, Joseph. Uh, indeed, uh, the students who are enrolled in my course, uh, they, they enter university by uh, answering nationwide questions that we call as the ADSA. Uh, this is a multiple choice uh, exam, supposed to be a proficiency exam, but indeed it is not. So at the university, what do we do? Before they come to the department, we send them to foreign language school. And they take a real proficiency test there from, from every skill, from reading, writing, listening, speaking, in addition to soft skills. And I got the results uh, from the foreign language schools. So I have information about their background in writing when they come to the first semester. When it comes to the second semester, I already have results from my first semester. So uh, I take this into consideration when I'm grouping my students. And uh, even at once, uh, I ask my students to write a uh, very, very brief text uh, in order to, uh, to cross-check 
uh, their proficiency and compare it uh, with the foreign languages uh, scores, whether, uh, whether they match uh, with each other. So that's how I categorize my students. However, uh, one of the drawbacks relating to the implementation of Turnitin is uh, Turnitin is no longer supporting uh, assigning individual peer reviewers to assignments. It used to support, but it doesn't support anymore. So it means that now uh, I am uh, assigning students randomly, unfortunately, because uh, Turnitin does not allow this uh, anymore. However, if I find any other platform uh, that I can do this easily and integrate a text matching software there, uh, then uh, I, I can do this again. However, anyway, uh, random assignment of students uh, to my experience, it works, it works properly too. Thank you, Salim. We have one last question from Catherine Derry asking, um, during the anonymous peer review process, or act Catherine, you want to go ahead and ask? Sure. Hello, Salim. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Hi, Catherine. I was just wondering, during the, um, the anonymous peer review process, how important do you feel it would be for uh, the reviewer and the writer to be able to exchange together uh, by means that don't disclose their identity. So if, if the writer doesn't understand the feedback that he or she received from the reviewer, um, what would be the means for them to ask for clarification to optimize their learning? Uh, in, indeed, uh, this happens quite a lot uh, because uh, these, are, uh, these are undergraduate students and uh, all the time before they exchange peer feedback, uh, I remind them about the language that they are using because sometimes uh, that might be too strict and they they may not be using a proper language uh, i mean they, they become harsh teachers uh, writing some harsh notes uh, to each other uh, my recommendation to them okay you are encouraging your uh, friends to become better authors so you can show them not only the weaknesses but also uh, the, the good things that they are doing in their paper so that they can continue doing in the, in the same manner uh, when they are revising their paper or writing new papers. However, uh, if they are unable to understand uh, any feedback, they come to me and ask me what to do. Uh, and my general feedback to them, uh, okay, check the accuracy. If it is if you believe it is accurate, then act accordingly. Otherwise, you don't have to change everything that your friend is asking you to do. And I forgot to tell you about one thing. Uh, at the end of the semester, uh, I, uh, when, when I score uh, my students, I use 60% from their papers, what, from what they write. The other 40% comes from the feedback that they provide. So I score the quality of the feedback that they are providing. And then combining their writing scores with peer feedback, the quality of uh, peer feedback scores. So it is an encouragement and also uh, an acknowledgement for my students for the time that they devote for doing this peer review task. Thank you so much, Salim. My pleasure. And so I want to thank so much, Salim, for um, a very, very interesting. I, I, I just like Julianne Bertrand wrote, she's um, going to keep some of your ideas for her classes, and I am going to certainly do the same. Um, I'm actually going to ask you. I'm going to write to you. Um, specifically to ask you about this rubric that you've developed for peer uh, review, because I think it's so important uh, to show students how to do a proper peer review. And I think your rubric certainly does that. And so thank you again very, very much for the wonderful presentation. Very interesting. And um, hopefully everybody will join us uh, when we start again in September with our PUP webinars. Um, at the end of September, we will post them and so don't forget to um, keep in touch with us and see what we've got planned 
for the coming uh, year. And thank you again, Selim, very, very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you everyone uh, for being here.